it make you feel? Do you go all queer when you hear the cry of the wolf? Or when you clock a dirty great pair of fangs? A goggle-eyed cannibal pensioner? Or a bloody flowering of random violence? Well, for goodness sake, keep it quiet. In the snobby world of British cinema, horror movies are as popular as, well, a burning monkey at a masked orgy. Censors slash them, critics torch them. But the paying punters love them. But is coming up with new ways to get girls naked and then kill them really something to be ashamed of? Well, libertarians take note. The exploitation movie is in the front line of the battle for free speech. You're going to learn a lot, and not just about health and safety on building sites. So let's join these well-adjusted gents for a night of horror. We can always gouge our eyes out if it all gets a bit too... <laughs> Is it clear? No. How many? Lots. Oh, well, that is just great. Shaun of the Dead is a horror film. And like a lot of horror films, it's also very funny. British horror was dead too for a long while. But now it's risen again. Maybe the time was right. Since September the 11th, we're seeing a lot of terrible things on the internet and on the television. We have to match that artistically, because otherwise people will just start logging on to www.cutyourheadoff.com. There's this barrier you have to pass over of taste that you have to get beyond and just emerge yourself, get in there with the sick bags. Because we're all just bits of gore anyway. And cinema is the place where you want to see it played out in some kind of way. Perhaps we've always dealt with our demons by making up a few new ones. That's the British way of doing things. The horror film is to the British Isles what the Western is to America. An encapsulation of all those things that the British are renowned for being. like repressed. Uh, you can't really have horror without some form of repression. You can let it all out in horror films. Horror was invented on this side of the Atlantic, but it took us several years and a few peculiar westerns to admit we were so bloody good at it. The thrill of a scare is like nothing else. It's life affirming. <laughs> My first memory of film he was watching Dracula when I was four. I was totally obsessed with them. I was a very morbid child. British horror has obsessed filmmakers the world over. One US director who'd grown up watching our scary movies just knew it was a no-brainer to film anywhere else. When I decided I wanted to make a horror film, England is a terrific location. I mean, that's where Dracula went. It's gothic. Burke and Hare and Jekyll and Hyde and Jack the Ripper and all those British Victorian people who wrote all that stuff. It's uh, very cold outside. May we come in? An American werewolf in London seems to draw on a lot of British film traditions. You made me miss. The awful pub on the Yorkshire Moors called The Slaughtered Lamb, which is full of English character actors being really sinister and horrible. Go. God be with you. Stay on the road. Keep clear to the moors. Beware the moon, lads. Landis's tale of two Americans making the wrong choice for a gap trip was, like Shaun of the Dead, a film that didn't forget to put in a few gags, along with the gore. Did you hear that? I heard that. What was it? Could be a lot of things. Yeah? A coyote. There aren't any coyotes in England. The Hound of the Baskervilles? 
Pecos Bill? Heathcliff. Heathcliff didn't howl. No, but he was on the moors. <laughs> American Wealth in London was the first horror film I ever saw. I was really terrified. I was only 12, and I thought, am I going to come out of this damaged? <laughs> you really scared me, you shithead. Are you going to help me up or what? <laughs> It was one of those films that we all raved about. I absolutely pooped myself. I had nightmares for about two months afterwards. Jack? There was one other thing that the Anglophile Landis got right. Mr Kessler, I'm going to look into your eyes. Casting one of those lovely railway children in a key role. I play the part of a nurse called Alex Price, who... Uh takes a shine to this young man who has been attacked and lost his very good friend. A wolf? Did he say a wolf? Yes, I believe he did. And uh, the young man starts to turn into a werewolf. I remember the effects being fantastic. The most startling were actually watching the <laughs> as his muzzle kind of stretches out. Bringing bloody chaos to Piccadilly Circus was a piece of cake for John Landis, a former stuntman who even gave himself a piece of the action. We were only on the circus two nights, like four hours each night. And the rule was we could never block traffic for more than three minutes. And it was all going so well until he discovered that he couldn't really speak our language. It was the only time I had any miscommunication with the British crew was when I said, all right, right, just give me a shot of the hood of that car and we'll bounce the inspector's head off it. The whole crew was like... So I walk over, I go, this. The bonnet! Oh, Governor, why didn't you say the bonnet? What's wrong with you? I do find the end quite difficult to watch. Stay there. Because it is quite, quite violent. And I remember saying something to John Landis about it. I said, is it really necessary? And he said, but you have to remember that most of this happens because the bus avoids a dog. <laughs> The golden age of British horror Look. began with a roll in the hay. And this was the consequence. Terror crash-landed in the 1950s with the Quatermass experiment. Ray guns and spaceships were big back then, but this film was different. The Quatermass experiment, I think, is still a profoundly frightening film. It's like a kind of verite science fiction film. It was very gritty. It's Mr. Carew! It has a grey, cold war distinctly British quality. Quatermass takes its title from the leader of a British space mission gone very wrong. Director Val Guest and his team had invented Martian Gothic. It has a great central performance by Richard Wordsworth as an astronaut who returns to Earth and gets transformed into a, a monster. Quatermass was the latest from a tiny studio in the Berkshire countryside called Hammer Films. In 1954, the industry was in yet another slump. But Hammer's strictly B-movie policy kept them afloat. We used to make eight or nine films a year, which we were able to because of the quota system. 30% of the movies shown in English cinemas had to be British. So, you know, you could put any old rubbish in. They were in the business of making small films or at least films on small budgets, that made a great deal of money. And their first experience of making a great deal of money happened to be a horror film. Unlike almost everyone else in the film business, Hammer didn't see the new television service as an alien threat. Previously, they'd done good business with films based on popular radio shows, 
and then the company snapped up the rights to remake Nigel Neal's Quatermass television series. The Quatermass experiment first ran on TV and was enormously popular. Keep away, everybody. This thing may be dangerous. You in those next houses, grab some clothes and get away. One of the reasons for this is that there wasn't any other television channel in 1953, so it got that uh, perfect 100% share. Speed 230, 210. Then you done. The television original scared viewers senseless, but Hammer made the horror even more explicit. For the hard of understanding, there was a clue in the title used to be age certificates and they suddenly decided with what they considered more gruesome movies they'd given them an X certificate which stopped anybody under the age of 16 coming in. We didn't care about the kids. <laughs> Let's get everybody else in. An X certificate was an attractive thing in those days. Astronaut Carew soon turns into the monster the Americans retitled The Creeping Unknown. We don't know what it is. And the film reaches a climax when the creature, craftily created by Hammer's special effects department out of tripe, is fried in Westminster Abbey. Britain was gagging for more and Hammer immediately went into horror overdrive, ordering another gothic sci-fi entitled X, The Unknown, and buying the rights to make Quatermass 2. At long last, horror was coming home. <coughs> 20 years before, Hollywood had the bragging rights. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive! But they needed our help. The films that founded the horror genre were made in California by expatriates because we had the talent. You know, we had the great British horror actors, Boris Karloff, Charles Lawton. You're convinced the thing on this table isn't human. It was a bit of a crisis in Hollywood. But when sound came along, a lot of American heartthrobs found they hadn't got voices at all. <laughs> But there were all these English stage actors who were ready-made with their, with their rotund voices and their ability to project. We can't take all the credit, though. One famous horror actor didn't hail from Berkshire. I am Dracula. But even the stuff they were adapting came from the fevered imaginations of 18th and 19th century Brits. Gothic has its roots in a lot of British literature. Dracula, Frankenstein, and Jekyll and Hyde. These old European stories seize the imagination of the American filmmakers and the American public. British audiences were mad for it too. When Boris Karloff popped back in 1933, they gave him a villain's welcome. So why weren't British directors rushing to put ghouls on film? Britain essentially banned horror films, brought in this tough new H certificate that meant children couldn't go and see them. Some were refused certification entirely. This is a rather patronising establishment. Now, we really rather you didn't make these nasty, horrible films and upset the children and the servants. Hey, 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 what's the matter? I thought you'd gone. Now, the trouble with you is you think too much. For the major studios, horror was really just permitted in comedy films that only scared the wardrobe mistress. Glory be the ghost! One eye.